Welcome back, mining community. Hope we're all well. Um, so we have another episode today, and we are talking to Elder Oliverson, who's the founder and CEO of AEX Gold, um, a Greenland-focused mining company engaged in the, in the identification, acquisition, exploration, and development of gold properties in Greenland. Elder uh, has a background in geology, um, and we're going to have a chat to him about EX Gold um, and obviously what they've been up to recently um, and talk about Greenland as a mining jurisdiction. So that's welcome, Elder, to the podcast. How are you doing, Elder? Oh, well, thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, appreciate your time as well. Um, and for those that are looking on the YouTube channel, as you can see, I've got a little bit of a, a new setup here. Um, I've got a, a microphone now as opposed to just speaking uh, into, into the computers. So um, hope, hopefully you can hear me a lot better now, although I think the, the recordings seem to be pretty good from feedback that I, that I do get. So um, with no further ado, let's that's, um, that's get straight into it. And wonder, Elder, if you can just tell us a little bit about, about yourself, um, about your back, background and about your career. Yeah, certainly, Rob. Thanks. Um, yeah, so um, to start with, I'm an Icelandic individual. So Greenland is, is which we'll be speaking about la later on, is, is something that is quite close to Iceland and, and close to my heart. Uh, I studied geology here in Iceland. Um, it's a playground for geologists, glaciers, volcanoes, <laughs> whatnot. Um, and um, I started my career actually in geothermal, uh, geothermal energy. Geothermal energy in Iceland is what we use uh, as a primary energy resource for Iceland. So both to generate electricity, uh, heat for our houses, and we heat up the, the air, uh, airstrip in, in Kepler Airport, like everything we use geothermal essentially for everything. Um, uh, uh, vegetation uh, uh, of, of, of uh, agriculture, various different things. So I, I majored in that and I focused on building up geothermal projects outside of Iceland actually. And, and uh, very quickly on in my career, I was based in China, building up geothermal power plants in, in, in China, together with a group called Sinopec, where we built up district heating facilities, something that you can see Europe and UK is now suffering from very high gas prices. So in, in China, we were exactly doing that. We were replacing gas by drilling down deep into the earth, pumping up geothermal water and heat up houses. This became uh, an, an is a uh, very great, successful uh, company called Sign Up a Green Energy. Uh, it is, if not the largest geothermal district heating company, it's becoming to be. It's in three different or four different provinces right now, multiple cities. And it's a testament of how you move uh, knowledge from a country like Iceland to China, both in terms of people, et cetera, et cetera. So you can, you can hear I'm very proud of this project. But in 2012, um, uh, I, I sold my stake in this company uh, as a founder and, and we as a founders. And at that point in time, this was just going ahead. It had, uh, it's growing all around China. And I started to focus my efforts in Greenland. Um, and, and Greenland for us, uh, Icelanders is obviously, this is, even though it looks like our smaller brother, because in population, there are only 50,000, then, you know, as a country, it, it's massive. It, it goes more southerly than Iceland. It goes more northerly, easterly, and westerly. It's half the size of Australia. And what Greenland has, and we've always known about this, and I guess the world has only known about this, is the biggest grid mineral potential that the world has on surface. Uh, and, and from my kind of a geological background and being very close to Greenland and close to the environment there and understanding their background, you know, Iceland being under Danish rule once and now Greenland is, et cetera, et cetera. There is a close proximity in, in, in that kind of a Scandinavian family that we have in, in the Northern Hemisphere. Okay. Um, so obviously uh, you're the CEO of AEX Gold. Just wondered if you can tell us about a little bit about the company um, and maybe why you joined the company. Um, and a little bit of background and the history. No, certainly. I mean, I, I founded the company uh, uh, in 2012 rather than 13, right? Uh, and at that point in time, you know, even Icelandic companies and Icelandic people have engaged in building most of the infrastructure in Greenland, right? 
But there was not much knowledge about mining in Iceland. We know about processing aluminium and we know about building up energy uh, ventures and so on. But there was a knowledge of servicing Greenland and building up infrastructure, obviously together with Denmark and others and on Greenland themselves. But we were, we were very close to them um, in terms of all various different things. So I started studying this and I got involved as a K in Cardiff to help me understand the potential of Greenland. At the same time I'm doing this, the mineral sector as a whole is going into one of the deepest, deepest recession you've seen it, right? So there are more money moving out of the sector rather than into it, uh, which kind of gave us this opportunity. After exploring the whole country and understanding the mineral potential, we decided on focusing on, uh, on in the south part of Greenland, which is uh, where our projects are. And in South Greenland, you have mineral potential in strategic mineral, one of the biggest rare earth deposits, and the gold belt that runs through that. And we focused on an asset there called Nalunak, uh, which was a, a producing asset at that point in time. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that we could see that we could easily operate in South Greenland. I mean, in Reykjavik, which is more northerly than South Greenland, you know, if you can build and, and have a city there and, and all of that, you certainly can do that in South Greenland. And also we just saw the mineral potential there. So when we founded the company, we started by acquiring assets, uh, building up land packets, building up knowledge. And it wasn't actually until in 2017 that this company got listed first on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And then in 2020, it got uh, dual listed on the London Stock Exchange. Um, so in a nutshell, we've raised in total about 100 million Canadian dollars. That would be about 50 million sterling or, uh, or 58 million sterling in total. Uh, we have uh, our, the largest landowner in Greenland or becoming to be one of the largest landowner in Greenland. We have the support of very strong institutional investors in London and in Canada, uh, sovereign fund of Denmark, sovereign fund of Greenland, the largest pension fund of Greenland. The board and the management, I think, collectively we hold about 10 to 15 percent of the company, so we are directly investing in it. And we built up, I would say, a world-class team around in this company uh, with various different individuals who have been with major uh, players like Extrata, Clancourt, uh, Barrick, uh, uh, Kinross, uh, E2 Gold, uh, and and also within financial institutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we feel with a very strong balance sheet, good cash position, strong team, and a world-class asset under our belt that, that we have a lot of value to bring to the market in, in coming years. Okay. Um, so I just wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about the project, um, and I suppose what attracted you to, to it? Yeah. So the main project for us, so we, we have, we have in kind of to explain what the project is. The main project that we listed our capital was around resurrecting and bringing Nalunak mine back into production. And Nalunak mine, what, one of the most interesting parts about Nalunak is that this is one of the highest grade gold mine in the world. It has a resource currently of 250,000 ounces at 18.5 gram per ton. 250,000 ounces is, is not much, right? But the exploration potential, the higher limit is 2 million ounces. And we know that because we've explored this deposit and we defined it in a such way that we know it continues one kilometer up the mountain and it's also open as that. So what we've been focused on is to drill this out and get this ready to start uh, extraction, right? Um, what is interesting there is that also about more than 100 or $150 million have been invested there in civil infrastructure. And that is quite important in the Arctic. So roads, harbor, uh, 20 kilometers of underground, mine working. All of these things take time and it's quite difficult to build. Thirdly, it's fully permitted. In, in the day and age, if you want to be in an OEC jurisdiction like Greenland, having permits and having a way to start developing is quite valuable and important. And you see that, that the permitting time, I think, worldwide is about seven years. So it allows us to build a mine in a relatively short time to generate cash flow. And then we get this operating base in South Greenland to be able to explore the deposits around. The second part of this, which we've been working on as well, is the other assets, the vast potential of other assets. And to take that into, put that into perspective, Greenland opened up only in 2009. And I like to steal this quote from one of my investors who says, most of the world has been mined for the past 200 years at Greenland, Afghanistan, and Colombia. 
And we are certainly in Greenland in an OECD jurisdiction, which is essentially a Scandinavian company. And we have asset and land mass in total of 4,000 square kilometers at the moment. We have all of our resources are on surface. What I mean by that is that you have deposits on surface. They have all been discovered. They just haven't been quantified. That's our task. So we are doing the first year of physics, the first channel samples, the drilling, and so on. So it's very virgin exploration. But the story of Greenland since 2009 is that the largest world-class deposit in everything from titanium, iron ore, rare earth, PG, I mean, I could go on and on, have been discovered in a very, very short period of time. Uh, and the question then is, how do you then build it? What's the next stage? And that's where we want to be in the forefront and, and, and why we think this is so interesting. Okay, um, just wanted me to tell us a little bit more about Greenland, obviously as a, as a mining jurisdiction, obviously you've explained a little bit there. Um, maybe some of the positives, maybe some of the negatives. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think um, to be frank about like the positives are certainly the fact that you have a landmass that with little to no vegetation on surface. And you have a glacier that, that works as a giant shovel, right? It cuts the land from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the fjord. And therefore you have all of this access to the rocks. You can see the rocks. You don't have any overburden that hinders your site. Therefore you see so many of these deposits on surface. Therefore the geology there is very straightforward and easy to track. It's like being in Texas 200 years ago, <laughs> so like when they were starting the world. And um, second part is access. Access is actually quite good because you have these fuel systems to get very close to these assets and, and, and be very close to them and so on. I would say the negative part of what is, what is maybe uh, something that we need to work on is the operator system. There's only 50,000 people who live on this island, which is half of the size of Australia, as I said here in the beginning. So how do you do it? And we believe uh, that becoming a strong operator in the jurisdiction where you operate with the people, but you also have to be able to bring in people who can build this. And one of the routes there is via Iceland and via Newfoundland and via UK and others, but you have to understand how you do that. And that is the main task in, is how do you execute, how do you operate and knowing how to operate and build infrastructure and projects in a region like this. But mind you, I think it's important for people to gather is that often I get the question, is this like Nunavut, right? Where you have two months of shipping. It's not like we are, it's I3 where we are all year round. We can go in and out all around. We were drilling up till mid-December, and we could be drilling right now. There is hardly any snow on the ground at the moment in South Greenland. So it's not, you can't, it's a big island. You can't look at it as one island. It's quite different where you are, and you have to have an understanding how you operate. And what I would say uh, as last point, snow and frost is not a difficult thing. It's something you can manage. You just get snowmobiles or something to manage, but... Things like corruption or not have a good legal system or not have stability that Greenland is, is actually very challenging to deal with, right? And, and the good thing about Greenland is that they're very supportive, uh, the government there for mining. They see this as an opportunity to bring minerals to the world that is needed for this green, green transition, being in, under our licenses and other. They want the, the legal system that is very, very strong based on Scandinavian Canadian legal system. So environment, we know we are, for example, in a pristine environment and we know we have to protect it and we know we have to do it in a way that is in harmony with both nature and, and, and people there. Uh, so, so you have all of the elements that are important. Maybe last point there also on a positive note is that a few years back, I often got the fact like where you're mining, there's no one there. That is also a very positive point today because we're not breaking down forests, we're not moving animals or even moving cities or towns. We are actually very, very far from anything in an area that has, often we are rather trying to find ways to build a vegetation in those areas rather than not. And therefore, it, the harmony that in building this project up is, is often better than in many other jurisdictions. Um, why do you think there has been a sort of a lack, in, a lack of investment or a lack of exploration or even focus um, within, within Greenland over, I suppose, over the, over the decades? Why, why do you think that? And, and I suppose, obviously, you're, you're going in there now. Why haven't people had the same sort of thoughts similar to yourself? Yeah, I think I think it's 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 timing and cyclical. Those would be my answer to it. So so if we go back to 2000, right, this year 2000, then obviously 
At that point in time, most of these minerals that we are speaking about today either cost on spot market, it was due to the build up in China. So the last mining cycle, should we agree that that was from what, 2002, three to maybe 2010, 11, right? It was, it was that kind of a cycle, right? And no one knew that they were in a mining cycle probably until 2005, right? So you can see that the mining code in Greenland, the new mining code, really didn't come in, wasn't put in laws until 2009, right? But when it was put in place, this was at the time when people understood that there's a lot of mineral needed to support the world in, in that and there was building cities, et cetera, et cetera. However, then you had the financial collapse, which we in Iceland know very well. <laughs> and then you, you had that kind of a filter all around the world. And, and the mining companies, they changed. They changed from being focused on building up resources to become more focused on their cash flow, dividend policy, and so on. So they stopped exploring essentially for almost a decade. And therefore, when you have stopping, stop, you have stopped exploring countries that have just opened up, they don't get the same amount of investment. Okay, and we fast forward today, and this is what we saw as an opportunity. I'm gonna to admit to you one thing, Rob, I thought this cycle would turn around much quicker than it did, but we, it didn't change our focus in our investment strategy. We knew that this is a fairly simple calculation. If you take much gold out of the ground and you don't replace it by finding it, you're gonna run out, or if that's copper or any other. And that's what everybody is seeing today. So it's not only about increase in demand, it's actually the supply side is more difficult than we are seeing. So taking that into account where we stand today, we started investing in an industry where most people invested in Facebook and Google, and sometimes I wish I did that. <laughs> but we, 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 we stuck with it and we understood land was important, exploration was important, and development of assets and how we get that into production. Where we stand today is that we are now sitting on what I believe is one of the best land and district for strategic precious metals and even things like graphites and other things, rare earths and so other things in the world, right? And it's in a jurisdiction that is open to mining and it's, in, it's, it's actually quite important that this is mined for the world in this kind of transition from fossil fuel to, to green energy. So, so, so this whole 2000 to 2022, just this time, you can see how many cycles have gone through it and what, how that affected investment and where Greenland was actually there in terms of putting the legislation, opening up the country and where we are today. So this is, is a relation to time and sick, sick being, being correct, at the correct place in the cycle. And therefore we managed to be counter cyclical to the market, we believe. And therefore, we have such a valuable opportunity today, which we think is very undervalued at the moment, even, even today. And, and we have a, a lot to bring more value to the market just from, I mean, essentially all of our, our different aspiration assets that are not even, even priced in, in the price of today market. Yeah. Well, hopefully we are at the bottom of the market. So fingers crossed, there is obviously hopefully going to be more money pouring into the industry, which obviously is needed. Um, mm. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the other companies that are obviously exploring and developing uh, within within the country? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, certainly. So I think I think from the top and the bottom, I see Greenland is there on, on, on top of your head there. So if you, if you look on the top of the yeah. of the map there uh, uh, behind you, so yeah, all the way from the top there down down to the bottom. So on the western eastern side, you have various different deposits. We have actively 12 operators there now operating and exploring. Most of the land and, or, or the uh, prospective land has been licensed now. So people are getting to be late to coming to the party right now. And when we started in South Finland, there were only two licenses there. We're not kind of licensed most of these things. So uh, you have the likes of Anglo-American, you have uh, Blue Jay Mining, uh, which is known to the London market. You have uh, various listed Canadian entities, uh, looking at molybdenum and also side PGM, um, you have uh, active government interested in the country. I mean, you saw the news Trump wanted to buy the country as an answer to rare, China rare earth dominance in the world. Uh, you have um, company Orano, which is a French state uh, owned uranium producer, also having licenses there. So there's a, and there is a mix of larger player going into the country, acquiring assets. There's a mix, there's always the Chinese involvement in some of these projects uh, being sink, one of the largest sink deposits and one of the largest rare earth deposits. 
So, so you have multinational, both uh, what we call SOEs or state-owned enterprises, and or and or you know companies like Anglo American already in country, and we are seeing more and more interest on the island at, at the moment. Um, can we talk a little bit about obviously the country's mining regulations and um, how supportive they are, they are, um, and also mm. I suppose the local communities and what their perceptions are of mining and and what what you guys are, are doing and obviously other companies. Um, how how is the sort of local communities reacting to all of these big multinational companies coming into coming into the country to um, explore their land? Yeah, so I mean, I can only obviously speak on our behalf and how what, what we are feeling with the local communities. Uh, so I think I think generally the government, every single uh, political party in Greenland is pro mining. They are not necessarily pro pro uranium mining, and so just always that because they 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 put a ban on uranium this extraction. Uh, that was partly due to radioactive mineral, but more, I would say, it was related to the fact that there is one of the largest uranium and rare earth deposits uh, sitting only one kilometer away from a 1,500 people town. So if you put that into perspective in a 50,000 people country, that's like you would put up a uranium mine one kilometer away from Manchester. Like you probably not allow that in, in Manchester or, or the community there. So there is an understandable reasoning behind there, uh, that, that angle. In relation to us, what we have strived for, and we are seeing support with the communities, with the people who are working with us for the mining operations that we are in. And I think it's, all, it's, part, it's due to two things. We have a huge emphasis is that everywhere from board, management, people on site, in various different parties that we have, predominantly Greenlandic people in every single level of this, right? So what we have been doing is that we've been working with the Greenland School of Mines, uh, educating people, uh, building up career with them. We've been working with them. We have two geologists there now been uh, educated in, in uh, both in, in Greenland and, and outside of Greenland in the University of Copenhagen who are now working with us. We have a, a board member who, who lives in, in, in Greenland. So, so that is important. We're also providing a lot of work and jobs and we are also putting emphasis on saying okay in our environment we want to be able to not only build mines we want to build up infrastructure that can serve the community there so we think about things like you know can we build into our mine plan things like building up hydro or wind electric for the mine right and if we can do that when the mine hopefully in 20 30 years will be finished can that infrastructure stay behind so the local go government can then use this clean energy rather than using diesel to heat up the town of Nordstolik, for example. Or we work together with the school districts in building up um, vegetation programs to kind of offset any carbon. But it's not only about offsetting carbon. I mean, in my farm where I come from in Iceland, we, did have, we had one tree when, when my mom and dad moved there. Half of the land now is with tree. And there used to be a saying in Iceland, you know, if you get lost in a forest, stand up. <laughs> so, so you have a similar thing in Greenland. So you can actually have an impact in the pristine environment to attract more wildlife, more vegetation and so on, and make the place more transparent. For the Icelanders in those days, it was all about having wood for building materials and stuff like that. So those are things that people can think of and can benefit the community. And I feel that the community understands that at least we have a very good relationship in, in operating and they have been very supportive and, and, and good to operate with. Right? Um, can you, uh, obviously going back to a, a X, um, can you talk us through the strategic mineral targets uh, on the actual license um, and why these are significant? Yes, I mean, I think, I think it's an interesting, so in our initial strategy was to build the mine, get into production, and then start exploring. When we had to hold our development last year due to COVID and various aspects, we then put started exploring one year earlier, right? And I think the best way to look at our asset base is that you have the gold belt, and then you have the strategic mineral belt. And in our strategic mineral belts, we have samples on surface, which are, for example, 3.4% copper, 4% uh, zinc, 19% niobium, I mean, on surface. And all of the elements in that uh, strategic, strategic mineral belt that we have, uh, 
suggests that we are having a mineral system similar to what we call IOCG system, which is like Olympic Dam in Australia or Arctic in Sweden, which is obviously very, very significant. This mineral system sits next to the big intrusions where all the rare of that. So there's a lot happening in, in the geology there. So what we did this year, we started doing geophysics, we're doing soil samples, and we're trying to understand the scale of this. We also picked up new licenses where an old copper mine was in 1920s, which is mined for 10 years, very high grade, typical kind of a almost artesian copper mine, but it was, like, it was a copper mine. So there's definitely mineral ore there. In the Nalunak Valley, we have a PGM uh, um, uh, dike plated uh, uh, deposit on surface, which we resampled 10 gram per ton palladium, like 2% uh, nickel. It's, in, it's, it's five minutes from the road. We are finding three in three different locations graphite in the system. And there is an old graphite mine in the, in the system there. And this is the same kind of a geology that goes through Norway, where the only graphite mine is for, 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 for Europe. And when you think of graphite, well, graphite is, you use as much graphite in a lithium battery as lithium. So we had found a deposit three years back where we had pictures where we saw the glacier had retrieved, I think, 300 meters. And we found this deposit that is five meters thick, two kilometers uh, long of We have various bits and pieces in there, and, and it's so much and so exciting that we are trying to focus ourselves maybe to 10 targets, but this is a whole set of different um, the things that are on surface and need to be quantified. And that's different. Most of the time you are doing your geophysics first or like remote or mineral system model, and then you try to find something. Here we found it, and we are trying to quantify it. And that's why it makes so exciting in, in this day and age where these minerals are quite important to the world. Certainly. Um, are you looking at any other uh, prospects in the area? Um, and if so, what, what are you looking for? And is there certain, certain criteria that you may be following? Yeah, so like there are so many low hanging fruits. So we, the criteria that we follow is that there are evidence of mineral assistance, meaning there is discovery already. So we want, we want to go for the discovery and then try to quantify it. So if we can see it, touch it, and, and understand it's there. Also, we want to make sure anything we pick up, we, we want to know we can mine it, right? We want to understand we, we can mine it. So those are the things. So for us, we are looking, looking, we always have our eyes open to looking to acquire something that is in gold or the strategic minerals, right? So those are the two elements that we look at. Uh, and we actively pursue them. And one of the key elements that we have, maybe compared to many else, is that we have bought many assets over the years. And with those assets, we have gotten data that expanded for the past 20, 30 years, very expensive data. And then we run them through our mineral system model. We even used companies like Goldspot to do an artificial intelligence to kind of uh, acquire more things. And this has given us a lot of different uh, opportunities and, 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 and discoveries, actually, that we are hoping to, well, we're still asking those discoveries, but, but we're hoping to bring those to the market very soon. Quite exciting, yeah. Yeah. So uh, what is the outlook for the next sort of 12 to 18 months? For us, our focus is that we are delivering the results of our drilling in Nalunak, uh, our to the market uh, in the next two to three months, okay? We, that drilling result, it is also, that drilling result will tell us a few things. It's obviously great and so on, but it's also continuity of the vein. And it's also to prove up the mineral system model that we are looking to put in place, right? So those are, those are quite instrumental for the company because it will give us a map to increase the resources systematically. And for anyone in the market can then understand if we drill one meter up or one meter down, this is what we're expecting to increase the resources. So that is very interesting. We are then bringing on um, results from our geophysical survey and sampling survey from Vagar, Namnok, Sava, uh, uh, Saka, and uh, Nureal. These are essentially gold, strategic minerals, PGM, graphite, and, and, and rare earth plays that we have. And this is all coming to the market in the next two to three months. 
substitute results, and stage result and geophysical survey, they will either underpin further exploration next year, which we will have to look into how, how we implement, and also further drilling next year. During this whole year, we have we've just released our IFS by the end of last year, which confirmed all of our costs for the project, the processing plant, which we bought 60% of the equipment for and so on. And so by the time of the end of this year, we should be in the position where we have hopefully uh, are getting closer to a PFS or, or a PEA on the null like deposit, which will open up for us more funding options to deliver the project fully into, into production. But at the same time, we want to be continuing exploring the vital portfolio because there is where you have the chance to have these world-class deposits, which is the world is now, now looking for, as we see. And lastly, um, is there anything else that you want to add um, or conclude on at all? No, I, I just think, uh, first of all, thanks for having me here. Um, we are obviously very excited for the year. And I think, I think it's important, as I said earlier, I think in, on this podcast is that uh, mining is a relatively kind of, a, it, it's difficult to build mines. It's difficult to set them up and it, it's, it's, it's not an easy task. However, understanding what you need for the world is a fairly simple process. When you mine something, you, take, you use it for an equipment, computer, or anything like that, you need to replace that in the ground. Today, people are talking about mining in the middle of a Pacific on a four kilometer depth. They are going into regions that are uh, 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 politically very unstable. Uh, there is a lot of security risk in the world, you know, being the most recent updates in, in Russia or in China. So what I would say is what we have as a portfolio of asset, the team, well-capitalized company, an opportunity that larger companies, the investor base is looking for. And therefore, if we feel that there's going to be a shift in focus in the investment community towards maybe a little bit less tech to more like real assets, then, well, I don't mean like the real assets, I mean more kind of a physical asset or deep value plays. I think we are a very good option for people to look at. Yeah. Uh, Elder, really appreciate your time and um, uh, giving us obviously an overview of Greenland and what, what prospects the, the, the country has as a mining jurisdiction. As you've explained, there is certainly a lot of potential there, un, un, unexplored to a certain extent, and there's so much potential. So um, obviously, wish you well um, and AEX Gold um, in your endeavours moving forward. If our audience wants to reach out to you, if they've got any questions, uh, how can they go about doing that? I mean, we, we have, you know, every single RNS, we have a direct email contact or, or even our phone numbers that they can do uh, or through our, our uh, PROI investor relations. So feel free to be in touch. Uh, we will also will have a lot of marketing material and or conferences and so on. So we, we will try to be as much of a public company as we possibly can. <laughs> yeah, certainly. And any social media platforms at all? Yeah, so we're on Twitter, we're on all of these uh, LinkedIn and various different uh, uh, fronts, so you can follow us there as well. Um, and uh, and and we will certainly be 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 telling the story of Greenland and us here as as we've been doing on this this interview here. Yeah, great. Really appreciate your time. And for those that are listening, um, please share this episode because obviously, as as um, Elders just explained, Greenland is very underexplored there's so much potential there so um you never know if you share this episode to others in the industry um you never know some of them could be mining in greenland um in the coming years or decades so um really appreciate you uh, listening please keep sharing the episodes um and like and obviously this one as well um and until next time happy mining <laughs>